podcast presented by Overdrive. Before we get into today's episode, remember to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Those ratings mean a lot and help us get seen by more folks just like you. You can follow us on social media. We're at ProBookNerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can send emails to professionalbooknerds at overdrive.com. My guest today is Hafsa Faisal. Hafsa is the New York Times bestselling, award-winning author of We Hunt the Flame, We Free the Stars, and A Tempest of Tea and the founder of Icy Designs, where she creates websites for authors and beauteous goodies for everyone else. A Forbes 30 Under 30 honoree, when she's not writing, she can be found designing, deciding between Assassin's Creed and Skyrim, or traversing the world. Born in Florida and raised in California, she now resides in Texas with a library of books waiting to be devoured. Hafsa's new book, A Tempest of Tea, is out February 20th. Well, Hafsa, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. To get us started, could you tell the listeners a little bit about A Tempest of Tea? Yes. So A Tempest of Tea is my new book. It's the start of a new duology set in a sort of Victorian England-ish type setting. Um, I like to describe it as Peaky Blinders meets a dash of King Arthur with vampires and a heist. Um, It follows Arthi Casimir, who runs a tea room that doubles as a blood house at night, so it's illegal, and caters to the local vampires that society doesn't doesn't really like. Um, And when her tea room is threatened, she strikes a deal with an unlikely adversary who is handsome, and, and now she has to infiltrate a glittering, dark vampire underworld known as the Ethereum, to retrieve something so that she can get her um, tea room back. Of course, she can't do this alone, so she pulls together a, a likely crew of ragtag misfits. And yeah, that's the book. You had me when I saw heist in the description. I was like, okay, always down for a good heist story. And then seeing vampires plus King Arthur plus Peaky Blinders, I was just... <laughs> I was sold from that moment on, but the idea of blending all of these pieces together, where did th- where did that come from for you? Well, when I started writing the book, it was it was going to be my love letter to all things dapper. And when I started doing that, I realized I couldn't really write dapper without also tackling colonialism. And so that's how Arthi came into play where she's this angry girl who's been through so much and this is her story. Um, but when I introduced the tea room, because that's like integral to Arthi's um, history and, you know, I love tea and I started researching tea and all of that. And I thought, I want something deeper happening, something something that people don't expect. And I feel like I was sitting and discussing this with my sisters and we were like, what if in those same cups they served blood? And so vampires were introduced into the story. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing quite like just a, a room of people you trust to to bring it all together. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there was this one saying that my mom, who is from Sri Lanka, mm-hmm. and it's like a common saying that they had there where they would say that the English, um, the sun never sets for England because they had colonized pretty much everything. And when they sit to drink tea, they're actually drinking blood because it's the blood of all the people that they've been conquering all these years and colonizing. Um, And I think that might have made its way into it, into my subconscious somehow, because it makes sense now. (laughs) To take it way back, when did you first start writing? And what inspired you to write then? And what inspires you now? Oh, um, so I was I was never a reader or a writer as a kid, which I feel like is not the norm because most authors talk about how they've been writing since they could hold a pen. Um, but for me, I much preferred playing outside or doing math, um, which is strange now because I love reading and writing. Um, but when I was 17, I had been homeschooling for a while and I was really lonely. So my dad was like, you need to do something else. And so he took me to the library. I picked up some books and I devoured them. (laughs) 
And it was my first YA, my first foray into YA, and I just could not stop reading. And I could not keep waiting for him to take me to the library. And then I somehow discovered blogging about books. And eventually I just kept writing these reviews. And then I started getting sent books for review. And I had devoured so many books in such a short period of time that I guess I had this like really intense, very young adult novel-ish dream. And so I woke up and I was like, I've been reading all these books. Why don't I write a book too? And that was very naive thinking because it is not that easy. But I had a lot of confidence at 17. I wrote that manuscript and I queried it. And I was disappointed when agents didn't want it. But looking back now, I am very happy that they didn't want it. But yeah, that was my first foray into writing. And that was my first manuscript. But at 19, I finished We Hunt the Flame, which was my debut. That was my fifth book. And that's what got me published. Now, do you still have copies of your original manuscripts? <laughs> well, <laughs> I typed them up, um, but I, I did, for, some, for whatever reason, self-published that book. And so anytime I see the cover, I just cringe inside because I'm like, how? Why did I think that was a good idea? Yeah, I have not taken a look at them again, but yeah, they're, they exist. <laughs> <laughs> they exist. We'll keep it at that. <laughs> now, to go back to the heist, which we know, we know I love, what is the most critical part of writing a heist story? Is it your planning process, the execution and writing, or then in the narrative as well, those same kind of things, planning and execution, what do you think kind of pulls the most weight? Oh, it's finding that balance, I think, of explaining what the characters are going to do at the heist, like the planning process, where they're all sitting around and discussing the idea, which is also a struggle in the sense that these characters are just sitting. And so it's you still have to create that movement. And so they're sitting and they're explaining what they're gonna do, but at the same time, you have to have those surprises and you want to have, you want to save enough of it to be able to explain it as it happened, like describe it and show it while it's happening. So finding that balance was a bit difficult for me because it was my first heist. Um, but I'm also a very poor outliner. I have to have it unfold in front of me and let the characters like carry the story. And so that meant reaching a point where I'm like, oh, this is a better idea. Let me go back and plug this in throughout the story. So it creates for it, it, it creates a longer writing process, but I don't know, it's just more satisfying for me, I guess, or I cannot do it any other way. No, I like hearing that because that is how my brain works when I'm just trying to like write an email, it feels <laughs> like. But every time I've thought, if I had to tell a story, would I be able to make that outline to go and map it all out and follow that? And every time my brain says, no way, because halfway through a sentence, you'd go, this is the new direction. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of fun in that. It does create more work, but I feel like I like that discovery phase. And it kind of, if I try to outline too much, it sucks the fun out of that creativity for me. Um, I know that works for a lot of authors, but for some reason, it just does not work with me. Yeah, I always feel like if I get the idea out of my head, it's gone. So if I put it down as a bullet point, that was the beginning, middle, and end of its development is, is what it feels like sometimes. I get that. See, I cannot have, um, when I'm like planning, and I do have to have something written out, I call my, pre my process pretty much just organized chaos because I have to have things written all over the place and then put it all together. If I have it written out neatly that any sane person would be able to properly understand and create something out of, it won't work for me. <laughs> You're going to go, oh, I don't like this. I don't even want to look at it. Exactly. <laughs> I've already done the work here. Why would I need to create more something else from it? What could get better than this? It already looks good. We're fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, with that in mind, how do you determine pacing? How do you take the prep work that you do and kind of the organized chaos and work it together to direct the book forward? 
because you do play with pacing quite a bit in the book. There are there are these drawn moments that help you kind of suck into the character and get invested in who they are and what they're trying to accomplish. And then you have like the speedy moments that really push you and the, you, the reader, and the story forward. So how do you find that you build that? Um, well, it's more like, I'll feel like a scene is built pretty slowly, like it progresses pretty slowly so that you have time to like sink into either the character's headspace or the setting, the scene. And then if it slows down too much, I'll pick up the pace. Like, or usually I know that a faster paced scene is coming up. So let me like sink in here and let people like um, dig into the story and then I'll pick up the pace. Or if the pace has been progressing pretty quickly and we need like, I feel like that's kind of, it feels like breathing to me where you're running and the pace is like really fast. And so now you're breathless. So let me give you a beat to catch your breath again. And that, yeah, I think that kind of balances the story for me. That's usually how I go about it. I think that's a perfect way to put it, a chance to catch your breath, because I I appreciate the flow of your writing because it, it does give you the chance to enjoy what you built. And I think that also um, comes into play when you have, when you're a writer like me, where you're writing as you go, planning as you go and discovering the story as you go. So I, for me, if it's too fast and I need to take a breath and remember what's around me and all of that. So that's when I like slow down the beat a little bit. So we've talked about heist, we've talked about pacing, it gives a good sense of how you kind of line out the plot, but now the setting. How did you pick, kind of like, we'll say like pseudo-Victorian England, or, you know, how did you end up writing this kind of almost love letter to a time? I just wanted to write dapper clothes and like the... And what's more dapper than Victorian England? Yeah, like that gas, like... <laughs> the glass lit streets and, you know, the dapper outfits that were just so amazing. And it was really interesting to me to learn that the original Peaky Blinders, like the historical actual gang, they were the first ones to dress appropriately, dress fancily. Like all the other gangs were like dressed in whatever trash they could find. But <laughs> the Peaky Blinders gang, they just like took themselves seriously. And up until then, people weren't they no one took gang seriously and so I thought that was always very cool and interesting and like seeing them take themselves seriously meant that you know they were they determined how people view them um which I thought was really cool and fascinating and that was something I like to explore with Arthi where she came from nothing but she didn't allow anyone to see that yes she absolutely dressed herself for kind of the the persona that she wants yeah of course we are going from this this kind of english traditional thought for our our dapper folks what about when we get to kind of the other side when we are going on the adventure how did you go about creating the other half of the story so i've discovered since i wrote we hunt the flame and tempest of tea that i like taking an existing setting and creating new layers to it so you have that like initial grounding where you're like okay this is the setting that i'm in i know what's happening i i i get this world and then i'll twist it a little bit where it's like okay there are vampires here and there's this tea room and your main character is a character that you don't usually see as the main protagonist in a story set in victorian england so it's create like having that foundation painting that base i guess and then adding the layers that I want to carry the story forward. With Arthi, that was hinting at her backstory from the get-go and creating that balance with Jin, who is also a person of color but wasn't an immigrant like Arthi was. And so having all these different characters from different backgrounds and different, different personalities and where they came from and their, their backstories pretty much, um, and having them play off of one another so that each one gets strengthened just because they have another one to contrast off of. The the book resonated so well with me because I love exactly how you build settings that like our world, but just a little bit to the left is, is how I always find myself describing it. And it makes sense that having two characters that that foil each other very well balances the settings, balances the dynamics, and what a great time to say, how do you go about 
creating characters and character dynamics because we see these strong relationships and we see different interactions um, because there's so much depth in the story that I'd, I'd love to hear how you go about creating people and and making them work together. Well, for A Tempest of Tea, I have, I write in Google Docs, so I have different drive folders. And so I have one fo folder called The Graveyard. And in that, I have different manuscripts that say RIP Jin with this personality, RIP with Jin with that personality. It was my first time struggling a lot with personalities because with with my first book, We Hunt the Flame, I Fira, and I knew that I wanted to for like her exact opposite. And the rest of the characters just like slowly fit themselves in where they could. But with Tempest, I'm I think it was because I tried outlining more than I should have. And so I had character profiles built and all of that because it was my first time writing on proposal, which meant I had to create this package and send it off to my publisher that said, this is what my book is going to be about. And so they weren't, they weren't like trying to hold me to it, but my brain was. And so I had these character profiles where I thought that this character would foil this one and the romances would work out in xyz and all these different ways but as i started writing it that they just did not work out that way i think having three points of view kind of created a bit of a struggle because i wanted arthi to be a certain way well i didn't really need her to be a certain way she just was this is her story and this is how she wanted to be so jin came easily because he was the one that sort of balanced her out because she's very angry and he's a lot more lenient in how he views the world. Um, and that's when Flick came in and I needed to create that balance. And so with Jin, I just had to keep tossing away different personalities because they weren't fitting, all of them weren't fitting together. I also like viewing my world building as a character, like my setting as a character, because it shifts and it changes just like any other character does, viewing that as another component in this like scale that I had to create where everything was balanced. It's fun, it's challenging, but it can be difficult sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you've got me stumped there because right, it, it sounds challenging, but it sounds exciting. And I, I love the appreciation of the setting as a character because it's what keeps everything in the writing so dynamic. Mm -hmm. Where did your characters come from? How did, did you just have like, did you, was there a day where you went, I want a character like this and that's where? Yeah, Arthi came first. I think my main characters always form first. Um, and I remember telling a friend that I do not see any part of me in Arthi. I think I wrote all of myself out into We Hunt the Flame and Zephyr and Nasir. Um, and then she was like, what do you mean? Arthi runs a business and she does not listen to anyone else and everyone seems to be annoying her. So she is you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Went fine, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, so Arthi just was the first character that came in and I knew that I wanted someone to balance her out and that was always Jin. Jin was... I played with different personalities for Jin because I, I always wanted him to have to be the character that everyone fawned over, and he currently is. Um, but I didn't know if I wanted to make him edgy, dark, like a very comedic relief um, goof, or how I wanted to go about it. And I think when I wrote Flick, that's when I really like found his persona and like how his personality was gonna play out. I think I also wanted to explore um, what Arthi would look like if she was not so harsh. And that's when Flick came in. Um, someone who does not have such a jaded view of the world. And that's Flick because she's very um, sheltered and soft. And she sees the world from a much happier, forgiving lens. Um, and so I guess you could say I like, well, Arthi just came as she did, but I like to find that the, a nice way to foil each of the characters that I have. And so that's how the others came into play. 
Now, we do have a bit of romance in this book. Do you have something that you love about writing romance between your characters or anything you watch out for or... Oh, I love creating tension up until that first kiss. When I'm reading a book, I will like cling to every little touch or change in tone when they're addressing one another. Once they kiss, I'm just like, okay, I'm done. I'm tired now. Next. Having those little bits throughout are just my favorite, like those juicy little tense moments. And I feel like with Victorian England where they just just do not touch, especially when that came to Flick and her noticing every time that just watching Jin and him being scandalous when he wasn't really, that was just fun to write. There, there has to be something fun about like what they considered scandalous versus what we considered scandalous. Like just returning to that and having to build that had had to be delightful. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Do you have, do you find any challenges writing YA romance or writing in the YA space in general? I don't know if it's because I read a lot of YA and then read some adult, but I just love how in YA romance, we don't fully focus on the physical and it's a lot with how this character feels about the other one. And I really like angst and exploring those emotions and so writing YA romance is probably my favorite. Like I've considered adult, but I don't I just feel like I'd miss this. And like that the romance also has a lot to do with the characters discovering themselves and taking control of their destinies and who they are. And so it's a lot, it has so much more to do than how I feel about this person. Like why do I feel that? And what what does this how does this change me and change that other person as well? Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's any struggle. I just, I enjoy it a lot. Do you have a favorite character? I know we already talked about if you found that you didn't find that you put a bit of yourself into Arthi, but your friend did. <laughs> but do you have a favorite character or even a favorite memory while you were writing characters? I always enjoy writing the male characters because they're usually the love interest. I think Arthi is definitely my favorite because it was just peeling back all these layers to see why she runs the way that she runs, why she's angry, why why she wants to strike this deal and go through everything that she goes through for something that she's not fully sure she even wants anymore. Like, is Spindrift that important to her? So peeling back all those layers, discovering her and like writing her backstories and her emotions was just very satisfying and enjoyable to me. How long did you write Tempest for? How long were you working on the book? Um, too long, if you ask my publisher. I started writing it in 2021, I believe, or 2020. And I think it was scheduled to, we've shifted release dates quite a bit. Um, but the one time that I thought I was on track to finish the manuscript, I met my husband. And so I was talking to him, chatting with him. And then that was that. I just did not do anything. <laughs> so I wrote it for quite a long time. I feel like it must have been about three years. And now I want to return to the tea room because how can you not? You've already kind of shared the, the love of tea in your life. When did that start? When did you find this love of tea and what was kind of special in your life around it? As as you'll see in A Tempest of Tea, I mean, tea was planted and cultivated in Sri Lanka. And so my parents are from there. So anytime we go to visit, we visit the tea estates and all of that. And it's just such a staple. Like every morning, the day cannot begin without them making a big pot of tea. And that's like a big process because you have to boil it on the stove and, you know, it, there's preferences for tea leaves and snobs with all of that tea was just such a big part of my life that when it came time to writing a tempest of tea it just it wasn't even something I had to think about I was just like yes tea that's perfect that was the natural thing to drop in yeah what is your go-to tea Ooh, I love Harney and Sons and so I keep purchasing different tea leaves from them my go-to would be just breakfast tea, um, English breakfast, sorry. Uh, and then they have different flavored ones that I've been 
buying because I have tried flavored teas where they were flavored with like syrups and stuff like that. And they were just horrendous. Um, so it's really hard to find good tea here in the U.S. Usually we would have it shipped from Sri Lanka to our house. We would buy a big bulk and have it in the house forever. Um, but now that I'm married and living in my own place, I cannot easily get any. So I've fallen in love with Harney and Sons. Hey, that'll work, right? <laughs> yeah, it's actually really good. I love them. Now, I know you mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is a duology. Are you sticking to two books or do you already feel the pull of more in this world? Or do you have like a a, a solid whatever in mind, like a, a plan in mind for book two? Um, Not really. I feel like once I begin, well, when I write the first draft of the first book, I, I like there's all these possibilities that I can explore. Um, but once I start writing the sequel, because this is going to be my second duology, then I see, again, all the um, possibilities and ways I could extend this story and like deepen that inks without tying things up fully. But it is a duology, I think, because with We Hunt the Flame, my first duology, I really did want to expand the story into a trilogy. I had like an outline and everything for my publisher, but my editor really wasn't a fan of a longer series. I think she's more used to single books and stuff like that. So I ended up doing another duology. Um, so I just started drafting the second one. So I might change my mind as I get to the halfway point, but I'll probably stick to it. <laughs> we'll see. Duologies are are very on trend right now. I feel like people are always happy to know that they have like the the beautiful two book set to, to look mm. forward to but I am I, I feel like I am of the age I'm like yeah there's gonna be like eight books down the road and I love these characters please don't make them leave <laughs> well you can kind of cheat the system where you have um duology set in the same universe so you have like little easter eggs and connections to your first books oh, so, see <laughs> yeah I try so so we uh, we might be at least seeing some of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the plan. To start to wind us down, some questions from a nosy podcaster. Uh it, what are you reading or listening to right now? I just picked up Yellow Face. I've heard amazing things about it and so I was excited to see it in the bookstore the other day. So I'm about 10 pages in and already already stuck to it. We talked about it a little bit already, but when I say public library, what comes to mind? <laughs> the public library changed my life. Um, so that is what comes to mind because I went from being a very lonely teenager to basically where I am today. I could not be here without it. Everyone always has such a good answer to that. And it warms my heart every time because that's 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 what we're here for that's the point <laughs> yeah I mean it was just two librarians that came up to me and they were like we see you reviewing books for our blog because that's how I started I was reviewing bo books for their blog where they had like this little thing where if you review a book we will give you a free book and so I was doing that and it was like once a month that you could do it and so I was the only one doing it at that point so they came up to me one day and they were like, you're doing this all the time. Let me show you a whole new world. And that was pretty much my entrance into blogging and the world of publishing pretty much. So truly no joke changed your life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, and what a cool setup. Like review a book, we give you a book. That's... Yeah. Well, the first thing I saw was, well, my dad was getting me these books at the library and it just wasn't enough, right? So I bored one day and I pulled up the library's blog and they had a teen blog which I thought was cool because it's like a blog for teens and hey that's me so they were having a giveaway for a book they're like someone should come like leave a comment and we will pick one one of you to win this book I was the only one that commented and so of course I won the book but it was the greatest day of my life I just won a free book and that was, you know, how I went from there. I was like, oh, I got this free book and I can review and get more free books and just went from there. When you are a kid with no money to be able to purchase books, especially, that's just extra mind blowing. And I don't know, it's like someone seeing you for the first time. 
it just it goes to show kind of the invaluable resource that the library is it's it's access to to books at any time but it's also right you have those moments where they are giving away books that you get to take home and build your own home library with when you're a kid and you don't have money to go and buy books and things are tight or whatever the situation may be having something that belongs to you is is definitely so important and special in that in that development and right being seen mm -hmm. yeah it was changed my life like I said yeah <laughs> now I love to know what people like to eat so when you go to a restaurant what's what's kind of your go-to order or what's the thing that you can judge the restaurant by if they make a good this um well I don't really eat meat when I go out so I usually look to see if a menu has some sort of fish on it like usually if they do their salmon well and of course I'm a huge potato fan so if they have good french fries mashed potato whatever it is i am down for it potato for life <laughs> potato for life if they can do uh, there's nothing better than a good restaurant french fry if it's seasoned well and nice and just like crispy yes it seems like such a simple thing but there are so many of them that just do not get them right either they're not seasoned well or they don't have that perfect crisp on the outside and but soft like soft inside, inside. Yeah. yep if i've learned anything uh I have thought the same thing that, right, French fries should be easy, but apparently the only thing they're easy to is screw up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, aside from book two, is there anything else that you're working on right now that you can talk about? Um, I just turned in a manuscript that I have not announced yet, um, and I don't know when I'll be able to, but I've been referring to it online as my secret villain book. Oh, a secret villain book. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am excited about it. Um, it was also it also was a long process to write because there was a lot of back and forth with my publisher. That's what I was working on. And now I'm diving back into Tempest 2, the sequel. I didn't think about it before. Uh, we talked about it before we started recording the cover. I'm going to derail us from me being nosy mm -hmm. to be nosy in a different way. <laughs> Talk about the cover. How did how did you land on this design? I think it's perfect. It speaks to Dapper and T. What was that like? I've been a huge fan of Valentina Reminar. I think that's how you say her name. Her art forever. Like I was hoping we could get her to work on We Have the Flame, um, but she just didn't seem to be the right fit. But she does have a lot of dapper art and so when it came time to do tempest of tea i knew we had to work with her and i didn't know if she'd be available because she is pretty popular and pretty busy all the time for a good reason she was open to it i just put together like all of these ideas that i had and when you have an artist like her you don't want to tie them down with too many notes like please do this ugly thing that I have in mind but so I just wrote put together all my notes where I'm like Arthi looks like this and I'd love to somehow showcase tea and also the city because that's important um so people can can see the setting and of course her outfit and I sent it to her and that's what she came back with um it was just that contrast of like the wisps and the colors and the black background it just turned out so perfect on the first try yeah Ama she's amazing for a reason <laughs> she's just really good where can the listeners find you online i have a website hafsafaisal.com and i'm on instagram at hafsafaisal and on tiktok um at hafsa underscore faisal before we wrap up is there anything else you'd like listeners to take away from a tempest of tea oh goodness um i know i saved the toughest one right at the end <laughs> yeah how could you mm, you know <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope you all enjoy the story and can relate to Arthi in some way. Um, I feel like we write these stories, especially in fantasy, that have that sound so outlandish and extreme, like we can't relate to them. But deep down, the struggles are usually the same as what we face. And so I hope you can connect with her and the rest of the cast. Thank you for reading it. Listeners, make sure you pick up A Tempest of Tea. It's out February 20th. Make sure you're following Hafsa on social media. Uh, Hafsa, thank you so much for being here and for chatting with me. Thank you. I had a great time. Again, everyone, thank you so much and happy reading. 
Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com or in Libby. Our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen podcasts, visit evergreenpodcast.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com.